I'm Larry Weeks, and this is Bounce. Simply by offering people a choice, you change the way they choose. What you pay attention to becomes important. It isn't that you pay attention to what is important. What actually captures your attention becomes important because you're paying attention to it. We emphatically market to ourselves, I think, basically what Jonathan Haidt calls self placebing which is administering a placebo to yourself to create an emotional state which you cannot auto-generate through an act of will. If you like, we can't choose to be confident. You might argue that you can hack that, uh, that effect to some extent with four pints of strong beer. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Bounce Podcast. Today on the show, I have someone who's been written up as one of the most admired intellects in advertising, Rory Sutherland. Rory is the vice chairman of Ogilvy & Mather Group. Rory co-founded Ogilvy Change, a behavioral science practice. You may have seen one of his three, I believe, TED Talks, which are very popular and incredibly interesting and entertaining. You should, if you haven't seen them, check them out. Rory co-heads a team of psychology graduates who look for butterfly effects in consumer behavior. And these are very small contextual changes, which can have big impact on decisions people make. For example, tripling a sales rate of a call center by adding a few sentences to the script. Put it another way, lots of agencies will talk about bought, owned, and earned media. Ogilvy Change looks for discovered or invented media, seeking out unexpected and inexpensive nudges that transform the way people think and act. Before founding Ogilvy Change, Rory was a copywriter and creative director at Ogilvy for over 20 years, having joined as a graduate tra trainee in uh, 88, 1988. He has variously been president of the IPA, uh, has spoken at TED Global. As I mentioned, he has three TED Talks out there. The success of one of his TED Talks, uh, I believe the first one, Lessons from an Ad Man, was also instrumental in 2009, influencing the conservative party policy to spend no more money on speed cameras, but to spend the money on vehicle activated signs instead. And this goes back to the behavioral science practice, and uh, I'll refer you to the, the TED Talk. Rory writes regular columns for The Spectator, Market Leader and Impact, and also occasional pieces for Wired. He has a column for The Spectator called The Wiki Man. Uh, it's very interesting. It's covers his thoughts on technology and the internet, and he is a fire hose of interesting information and very fun to talk to, especially around the topic of behavioral economics and its application in the field of advertising. And that's what we talk about on the show today. It's a little different podcast, but I'm indulging myself because I, I've been a big fan of Rory's for a long time and wanted to speak with him and had some questions for him for a very long time. He agreed to come on the show. So for those of you who are not familiar, behavioral economics studies the effects of psychology on economic decisions. We talk about the power of choice, his findings in the field of marketing. We talk about maximizers and, and maximizing and satisfying. I thought it was interesting we have a discussion about brands and, and why brands have an advantage over generics for the most part, or outperform, I should say. So if you're an ad marketing nerd like I am, you're really going to enjoy this show. But everyone can benefit from learning how we are influenced. And I, I think that's kind of the takeaway here if you listen to the podcast. So without further ado, let's get to Rory. Thank you so much for coming on, Rory. Welcome to the show. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be on. It's a great honor to be on, in fact. I have a, a ton of questions. You're at Ogilvy, but you founded Ogilvy Change or co-founded Ogilvy Change. It's a behavioral science practice. Is that right? That's it. Yes. I think there's um, – well, actually, you mentioned Mad Men a little earlier. I could say in a way that Ogilvy Change was an attempt to restore to the advertising industry something it lost in the late 1950s. Um, in the 
uh, in the early days of uh, advertising, you'll probably notice in the early episodes of, of Mad Men, uh, there was a kind of bow-tied figure who was the agency psychologist or some such thing. Often, as I said, with a Viennese accent, sometimes even with a genuine Viennese accent rather than fake one. Um, and it was regarded as axiomatic in the early days that uh, the business of advertising and marketing had a great deal to learn from and possibly even to contribute to an understanding of the psychology of human behavior. And I think what happened, and we debate why this happened, but that got lost, or rather, perhaps the advertising industry deliberately turned its back on it. And the reason was it got very, very frightened in the late 50s and early 60s about any kind of accusations of um, subliminal effects, tip, uh, tampering with unconscious processes. Books had come out like The Hidden Persuaders, for example. Um, and if you look at the climate of the time, there were films obsessed with communist brainwashing, like uh, the, um, Manchurian uh, it's called the Manchurian Candidate and so on. And the, the ad industry kind of ran scared and went into this complete denial, claiming that all it was doing was essentially conscious product advocacy. And it did that because that was a pretense necessary to avoid um, wider investigation or criticism. Uh, the, the, the problem is, of course, that most advertising processes, I think, well, certainly a large part of advertising, does work at an unconscious level. And it's simply disingenuous to pretend that it doesn't. And so when I founded Ogilvy Change, let me give you a little story. I started in direct marketing in 1988 in what was then called Ogilvy and Mather Direct. And we had a client, uh, BT, or British Telecom, as it was called at the time, which was essentially the British equivalent of AT&T. And they'd modernized their exchanges in the late 80s and were selling products which um, I, 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 effectively – you know, you know the star and what you Americans call the pound button. We call it the hash button on the uh, uh, on the telephone. They were selling products which used the star key and the hash key, things like call diversion, call waiting, um, uh, and um, uh, a few other um, three-way calling. So in other words, they, they, these were products which hadn't been available on an analog telephone exchange but were available on a digital one. And we sold these products at a subscription cost of a few pounds a month by writing to people and sending them a letter which allowed them to phone BT on an 0800 number and order the product, or if they preferred to tick a box on a pre-lasered coupon at the bottom of the letter and send it back. And the client, slightly eccentrically, to be honest, it may be because they had unused resource at their call center, I'm not quite sure. The client wanted us to remove the option of a postal response so that you could only respond by phone. And you can understand why a phone company may want to do that. You know, why are we giving business to the post office? You know, we're trying to foster a telephone culture in the UK and so on. Let's try to get the response via phone. So, right. you know, let's, in other words, by removing one option, you theoretically in uh, – since, in economic terms, the transaction costs of both were more or less equal, I mean, they were, you know, highly comparable, what should have happened is the response that previously happened by post would have come in by phone. That's what economics would have told you. We, however, said, let's test this. And we gave, I think we... we took a random sample of three groups of 50,000 each. 50,000 got phone only. 50,000 got post only. And the remaining 50,000 uh, could reply either by phone or post. And the groups were effectively statistically indistinguishable. And the response rates, I wish I'd actually kept them or had some record of them. It would take me about a month to find out. Uh, the response rates were something like this. Phone-only letter got a response rate of about 2.6%, I think. The post-only letter got a response rate of about 4.9%. And the joint letter, the letter that offered a choice, got a response rate of about 7.4, 7.5. So when you offer people a choice, the response rate was more or less, not quite, but more or less the aggregate of the two letters which offered you only one means of responding. Now, the interesting question there is, why is that? Because in terms of any sort of recognizable economic theory, um, 
uh, you, you could argue, I suppose, you know, there may be, you could argue that people with an incredibly strong phone aversion and people with an incredibly strong aversion to using the post. Yeah, that, that's a, a stretch. That, that you, need, you need to assume that to defend economic, uh, microeconomic theory. Um, there are two possibilities, I guess, one of which is that we are disproportionately influenced in our course of action by how easy or agreeable the proximate step is which is what a lot of behavioral economists might say is, you know, if you make the first three steps on a journey comparatively easy, the likelihood that we start and therefore continue is massively increased. The other possible theory, and I, I wouldn't confine the theories to only two, by the way, is that simply by offering people a choice, you change the way they choose. So in other words, you might be shifting people now instead of thinking, do I want this product or not? Part of their brain is thinking, I quite like this product, should I reply by phone and post? Which is maybe an easier question to answer. But that there's a kind of placebo value to choice in that even if you know the difference in the two modes of response is more or less identical, nonetheless, the fact that we get to choose it somehow matters to us. Now, those are just two theories. I think they're the two best theories um, I've come up with in, you know, in, in, in the intervening 25 years. But at that point, I remember thinking, OK, clearly nobody in market research would ever say, would you like this product? No one in 100 years would ever say, well, how can I order it? Because if I can order it by phone, I'd like it. And if I can't, if I can only order it by post, I don't want it or vice versa. No one would say that. OK. Secondly, economic theory would not predict that outcome. Now, what that led me to believe and I, I'm just writing a book at the moment where I, I introduce this in the first chapter, is that there are what I call the broken binoculars, which is nearly everything we use or do to predict or attempt to influence or understand human behavior is seen through the lens of these, of the, these two broken lenses on a pair of binoculars. And one lens is market research, asking people on the assumption that they have introspective access to their own motivations. And, under, you know, the second one is economic theory. And a huge amount of what business does and decides relies on those binoculars. And they're both, neither of those binoculars would have told you what was really germane to selling BT core weighting, which was offer a choice of modes of response. I mean, my suggestion when I got the results was, Bear in mind, this is the late 80s, so email didn't, didn't exist outside a few specialist uh, uses. I said, uh, you know, we need to offer a fax number in response because we'll get another half a percent that way. Probably true. But probably was, but this, actually, but, yeah. but this, this kind of led to the behavioral arm of Ogilvy that you kind of – Well, yeah, funnily enough, that was – I mean, bear in mind, that was 1988, so it was uh, getting on for 30 years ago. But it immediately convinced me that there was a whole area of inquiry – in what I might call the decision sciences or, uh, you know, uh, in human behavior, which the, the ad industry didn't adequately address, but then in our defense, nor did anybody else. And for years, I always believed that there was this whole, um, this whole area of unseen and unlooked for opportunity within marketing. Um, and it was partly unseen and unlooked for because we didn't have a name for it. And then one day I'm reading, I'm ill for a weekend, and I end up reading, by the way, very good tip, bit of business advice, um, be ill or pretend to be ill for a few weeks every year. Because actually the time off you have to spend reading or thinking in depth and the long period of uninterrupted time. Uh, I, I, That's very productive, yes. Uh, Nassim, Nassim Taleb said to me, he said that the quality of human um, – uh, creativity has declined since they cured tuberculosis. <laughs> if you think about it, you had all these people like some Thomas Mann, etc., who don't come in. Remarkable, remarkable thing, which I haven't done to any level of statistical validity, but it's surprising how many people, very, very interesting people, suffered a long bout of illness or whatever in earlier life. I mean, Orwell was a great case, um, I guess, um, which is writing was about all he could do. And so having that having that period of your life where all you can do is read or write because you're too ill or at least you're pretending to be too ill to do anything else is really quite a valuable trick. But but I discovered eventually 
through spending this sort of period of, I, I was genuinely ill in this case, uh, reading economics books for fun. I then discovered the existence of behavioral economics, discovered that a book called Nudge was coming out in the United States in about uh, uh, three weeks' time. And I pre-ordered a copy from Amazon.com. So it was FedEx to me here in the, in the UK. So I probably had about the third copy of Nudge in, in Britain. And it went on, strangely, to, to have an influence in the British government as well, who very quickly, very, very shrewd government advisor at the time called Rohan Silver, very brilliant man, uh, recommended the book to David Cameron, the then prime minister. And so Thaler was welcomed into the corridors of power in the UK before he got to tread them in, um, uh, in Washington. But it was a wonderful, wonderful uh, advantage having very, very early access to this book and realising... So I'm not effectively that my suspicions were not totally ill-founded, and there was indeed an enormous field of study which could help explain behaviour in ways that both research and also um, conventional economic logic simply couldn't. So when was that practice started at Ogilvy? So we started it about six years ago. Um, uh, I always have to get this right. Uh, it was on Valentine's Day. I remember that. So it was, sorry, it wasn't on Valentine's Day. It was on February the 29th. It was actually on a leap year. And we've since grown to the level of uh, employing uh, sort of 13 or 14, mostly but not exclusively, psychology graduates. We have social geographers. I'd be equally happy to employ um, evolutionary psychologists, biologists, anybody who essentially got a very good instinct for, I think, complex systems, to be absolutely honest. I'm fascinated by this arm of, of Ogilvy. So a brand or a company will bring you in, and is it mostly research? Our first, our first step, to be absolutely honest, is to give people permission um, and creative inspiration but, but, but both together. And this is why, by the way, the fact that behavioral economics became a science is very, very important because it allows you um, not only to test uh, counterintuitive interventions or counterintuitive through the lens of research or, or, or standard economics, it also allows you to justify the fact that you are testing. But so you're also implementing, so just, just from an agency standpoint, you're going in and th there's research and, and these psychologists are, are doing some of that, I'm assuming, right? And then, I mean, are there briefs? Yes, so, so very much so. And also, by the way, uh, you know, you could argue that, you know, we could float off on our own. Uh, we think it's very, very important being within the creative environment of a, a, a an ad agency. And not only because it will supply us with a ready-made um, uh, pipeline of, of problems to be solved, which ad agencies are pretty good at you know, hearing about and being briefed on, but also because um, my general view is that the best way to approach behavioral science is to uh, deploy it in a, in a creative and imaginative way. So, for example, one thing I wouldn't say is that I, I, think, I think there's a fundamental misreading of science, actually, which is that nearly all scientific progress happens through a mixture of instinct, guesswork, and lucky accident. Okay? Yeah. The place that rigor belongs is in the evaluation of your theory, not actually, not actually in the origination of your theory. And, and, and far, far greater people than me, by the way, have made the same point. So Peter Medawar is one. Uh, another one would be, um, uh, who's that brilliant chap who did the O-ring stuff? A, a brilliant American physicist. Uh, he, he's also made the point. He said that theories start actually as a guess. Um, you know, he, and, and the, the whole audience laughed uh, when he said this. But he said, no, no, don't laugh. That's actually how theory starts. Someone guesses them, and then you go into an empirical setting and you test and evaluate them and see whether the reality lives up to the, the theory. So, so, you, so, so the team works alongside the, current, the, ad, the ad team or whoever's dedicated to the brand or the company, what have you, and then you bring in the, the behavioral, yeah. the psychology uh, part. So, so, so the psychology thing might be, let's say you want to... Uh, convey something, okay? Now, a scientist might convey something by saying it. A creative person might convey the same message by saying something 
very, very different. So let me give you, I'll give you a wonderful example of this, which is why you can't divorce the practice of behavioral science from some sort of, I think, creative instinct. So one of our very, very early clients was a newspaper publisher in the UK. And they had a very big problem, which is that they needed people to subscribe uh, online. And there were three different levels of subscription you could op opt for. Uh, it was a mixture of digital and paper and whether it was, I think, seven days a week or six. What we wanted to do was essentially, we, we noticed that a huge number of people dropped off. They'd made the call, but they dithered and failed to convert once you presented them with the choice of, of different subscriptions. We managed, I think, to more than double the conversion rate by simply adding the little thing. You can have option A, you can have option B, or you can have option C. Now, that's what they previously said before, and they described all three options. We simply added, most people choose B, but if you like, you can have A or C. Now, in making a decision, social proof is probably something people look for. It was a bad effect. Yeah. In, in, other, in other words, if you, if you look at the whole business as satisfying, the product that most people buy may not be the best product for you, but it's unlikely to be terrible. It's an easier decision. No, it's, it's an easier decision. Yeah. I, mean, I, I would argue, by the way, that um, uh, in many cases, it's actually social copying is rational in that if you're trying to avoid disaster. Right. I don't want to leave the tribe. I'll get. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, so I always, I always say to people, look, if you had to move to Jamaica tomorrow and you don't know anything about cars and you don't know anything about Jamaica, um, and you can ask a single question before deciding which car to buy, probably the best question to ask is what's the best selling car in Jamaica? Yeah, right. You know, okay. And so um, that, that may not be, you know, it may not be absolutely perfect, but you won't end up with a terrible car that way. It's, it's what you might call, low, I guess it's low variance, isn't it? Right, right. It's, right. you know, it, it, it might not be the optimal decision, but it's not going to be the worst either. Right, right. And it explains, explains the, the success of a lot of brands, right? Mm. Well, I think it also explains, I think what it also explains, by the way, is the, the shape of a lot of markets, which is where the brand leader outsells the number two brand by a fairly significant factor. In other words, you tend to get that shape, particularly in consumer goods markets, where there's the number one brand, and that outsells the number two brand by you know a factor of 1.7. It's I think it's Dirichlet distribution is the technical term for it. Now you wouldn't regularly see that shape if it weren't for some degree of social copying going on. What is your opinion on the current state of retail? Because you've worked with a lot of these large brands and in the world now of Amazon. Well, it may be, by the way, that Amazon makes brands irrelevant to its own detriment, by the way. Interesting. Uh, because if you look at, you know, if you look at a typical high street, um, a very large proportion of retail on the, on the high street is made up of the sale of um, essentially female fashion, female fashion and cosmetics. Those are all very high margin areas, okay, where brand value plays quite a high part. Now, one of the things that worries me the hell out of, about Amazon is that if it assumes economic rationality in consumers, by which I mean narrow economic rationality, I don't think brand preference is irrational, by the way, um, but economists assume it is. And if Amazon, let's say I use my Alexa to order something from Amazon, and Amazon goes, I will automatically supply the lowest cost AA battery because it assumes that that's what I want. Okay. Th that's the danger. That's the, but that's the, the, this da is that's, an extraordinary that's danger the that danger. You, have you have an algorithm that assumes that everybody's a skin flint, right? But if you actually offer 20 batteries to people or you offer 20 insurance products, people don't choose the cheapest. They make a trade off between the price and the reputational quality of the seller, for example. And incidentally, by the way, AA batteries and AAA batteries are not a commodity. Some of them last longer than others, right? So immediately you're using the wrong metric, which is you're using a metric that you assume a homo economicus rational actor should use, 
Well, actually, the rational actor shouldn't use that. There are many cases where buying a premium product pays not in the you're paying more for something ostensibly, but actually you're getting a, a reward in some other shape or form. That may be a, a reward emotionally in the in the shape of the fact that nobody buys a three thousand dollar handbag because it's really good at carrying things around, right? <laughs> okay. I think that's fair. Okay. Now, a really sort of parsimonious algorithm would say we need to sell women bags. Therefore, the purpose of a bag is to carry something around. Therefore, the only metric that matters is cubic carrying capacity divided by price. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, everyone would then go around with those sort of bags that refugees have, you know, those laundrette bags with a kind of weird tartan on them. Okay. Now, 99% of the handbag market by value is not really about anything to do with portability. The problem with economics is it always assumes this monodimensional price, that so there's a single unit utility, and then there's this thing called price, and all decisions are a trade-off between that. And it usually defines utility in an incredibly narrow and self-interested way. Is that why you're skeptical of Amazon? Because it's... it's well, it would certainly it's, scare me. It would scare the crap out of me. I mean, you know, someone who'd pay a quid extra for Duracell batteries because they generally last, it would scare the crap out of me that if I, automatic, if I ordered Alexa to get me some batteries, it would, without even my say-so, just default to the cheapest brand. But that's kind of what's happening via Alexa, I think. I think they're they're kind of sorting. I think Jeff needs to be deprogrammed from his... But, uh, but, I mean, do you think it's going to backfire ultimately like some pendulum that will swing back? I, uh, one of the things that was interesting to me, Rory, is this, this is the first year, this first Christmas, that I started to doubt my choice of Amazon because I had to break down box so many boxes. And I'm like... All right, maybe I need to go to the store, right? Well, actually, I mean, the, the one reason I don't go to the store, there are two reasons why, of course, uh, online shopping has particular um, uh, uh, appeal in the run-up to Christmas. Not only the fact that we're buying more, by definition, we're often buying things for other people, in which case, you know, generally an online description, or they may tell us what they want, for example, and we can, you know, that's the first one. And we can order it. So we don't have that same, I need to feel the texture we do if we're buying something for ourselves. Okay. And the second thing, of course, is stores are insanely crowded in the run-up to Christmas. So any day that doesn't involve a visit to a pre-Christmas yeah, shop. Yeah, parking's a nightmare. It's parking's a nightmare. London's just totally hellish. Okay. But a few of the things I was noticing with Amazon is the, the Amazon stock price is predicated on the fact that it's going to be as big as and as profitable as Walmart, okay? Uh, or, or twice as profitable and half. But, I mean, Amazon has a stock market valuation which is higher than Walmart's, okay? Well, they're, yeah, they're not making money, really. <laughs> they, don't, they don't make any money. I, I think Jeff, really. fires Jeff fires people, people, fires people. If, if, if one of his so department If they make manager, a profit, I think they get yes. into trouble. Yes. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Now, there are a few issues. If you look back at the early days of American Mail Order with Montgomery Ward, and you look back at American, uh, well, Sears, of course, started, they both started as catalogs. Within, it, it, and bear in mind, the, the big American catalogs were the 19th and early 20th century internet. Uh, they were for my parents in Britain, by the way. My parents were, my, gra my grandparents, I'm sorry. Um, my grandparents, when they were children, were in a relatively wealthy household in a Welsh mining town. If you wanted to buy anything exotic, you had this thing which was about 1,500 pages thick called the Army and Navy Stores Catalog. And you'd effectively order from that, and it was sent to your local railway station. So the whole Amazon thing isn't new. What eventually happened is nearly all these people ended up opening shops. And one of the reasons is that uh, there are many reasons. Shops are actually a more effective form of distribution than uh, sending everything by post one thing at a time. People travel to a store at their own expense. They wander around, they buy 46 things, and then they carry them home at their own cost, uh, at their own effort. Uh, generally, returns are lower, too, because people try things on in store. There are loads and loads of reasons why stores are pretty damn clever, to be absolutely honest. Distribution, of course, there's a very big difference between distribu distributing something to a thousand different locations in the UK and distributing something to the 22 million uh, households which exist in the UK. Well, well that's next. Amazon is going to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a collection, I mean, I don't know. But there's an interesting one, which is 
I was I was also doubting my loyalty to Amazon over Christmas because increasingly I would order four things and they'd arrive in two separate deliveries. And at some point, I reached the point where my, my front drive of my house was turning into a kind of logistics operation. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to talk about marketing and psychology uh, and touch on first the value of marketing in the sense that uh, of psychological ideas over mechanistic ideas. Um, and my question to you is, do you think good advertising in the sense that it works, not in the moral sense, is it simply framing or reframing communication, Rory? Uh, no, uh, gosh. <laughs> uh, I mean, this is a topic I'd like to write a book about. It works in more than one way. I think we have to accept that. Sometimes it's um, costly signaling in the biological sense which is the very fact that you've spent this money talking about your product is evidence of your confidence in its widespread and repeated popularity. And, and you'll be around. You, you're, you're, you're not you're going. Gonna, you're going to be, you're not going anywhere. There are occasional cases where things go bonkers, but actually it, it, it generally, it's a pretty good heuristic that a, first of all, a brand that has a lot invested in its reputation has more to lose from selling a bad product than someone you've never heard of because they have to suffer widespread consequences of disappointment, whereas someone you've never heard of can simply shapeshift and reappear somewhere else, okay? So it's, it is it is in part framing, but but it's also signaling in some of the other. Uh, so th so there's, co there's undoubtedly costly signaling and commitment, which, uh, I mean, if you think about it, I, 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 a flower is a weed with an advertising budget, as I've often said. And advertising involves <laughs> a huge amount of, there's a huge amount of advertising in nature. In nature, just as in human life, there are lots and lots of occasions where you need to convince someone of something. You need to convince a predator that you're toxic. You need to convince a, 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 a potential sexual partner that you're worth the opportunity cost of breeding. Or with. an insect to pollinate. And you need to con convince an insect that you might have a healthy supply of nectar and pollen. Okay. And... Uh, by the way, I think that this uh, signaling instinct drives a huge amount of evolutionary progress, by the way. I was just writing a piece. I'm totally puzzled by it. But if you think about it, if you, if you had a Soviet approach to flowers and said, we're going to basically get rid of all this unnecessary diversity in flowers, we're just going to unify, okay? We're going to have a common type of flower, and they'll all look the same, and they'll all produce the same amount of nectar, and they'll all produce the same amount of pollen, okay? <laughs> the problem there is that you get the free rider problem, which is it pays everybody. If you're not, if you don't have a distinctive point of difference or a distinctive appearance, there's no way for bees to punish you if you shortchange them on nectar. So it becomes a kind of race to the bottom, if you like. Okay, so there, you know there's an interesting need for uh, differentiation, brand differentiation, simply so simply so the feedback mechanism of reward stroke punishment. And the punishment can come in various forms. It can come in, I will buy you once, but I will never buy you again. That might be shampoo, for example, okay? You know, I bought this shampoo. It was heavily advertised, but it was shit, so I'm never going to buy it again. It might be that the threat of punishment is what is reputational damage by um, through a kind of commu um, a, a group communication. You know, banking was highly trustworthy when it served a local town, because the bank manager knew he only had to cheat one customer for everybody in town to know that he wasn't to be trusted. Yeah. So that was a reliable punishment feedback loop um, in a way that international global banking probably isn't. If your customers are spread all over the world and don't know each other, you're not as trustworthy as someone who serves an interconnected group of people. Now, looking at, you know, looking at how flowers work and how, you know, how you, prevent flowers from false advertising is a question I'm looking at at the moment. <laughs> By the way, but on the way about how advertising works, I forgot to say that framing is some of it. Okay. Um, mere fame, I think, by the way, is some of it. Mere it, fame? You know, it's it, what you might call P.T. Barnum stuff. It's just showmanship. It's just kind of being out there. Okay, okay? Getting, out, getting the yeah. message out. And then another one is the very Latin meaning of advertising, which is to draw someone's attention to something. Now, Daniel Kahneman, the good good new book, by the way, by Bob Cialdini, who I think is one of the godfathers of this field, wonderful man. 
And he, he says that what you pay attention to becomes important. It isn't that you pay attention to what is important. What actually captures your attention becomes important because you're paying attention yeah, to it. Attending and to it, it, it. Daniel Kahneman said, nothing is as important as we think it is while, while we're thinking about it. You're vested. You're, vested. you're, vested. you're kind of vested. Now, an interesting thing would be, one way in which advertising can work is it can change the relative importance and therefore the, higher, the, the, um, the position in our hierarchy of choice can be changed by directing our attention to something. I've got a lovely example of this, which is if you want to get to Paris, okay, the plane on balance from London is a bit faster than going by train, okay? So if you're purely using speed as a measure, you'll go by, you'll go by plane, okay? Now, the train is a bit slower, but it takes you from city centre to city centre, and it's one long interrupted, uninterrupted, two hours, 40 minutes of sitting on your bum, having a meal, drinking wine, or reading a book, or working, okay? Now, if you talk entirely about speed of a journey, people will focus on speed and how fast it goes, and that will become important in their decision-making because it's given a high degree of salience. If you focus on the niceness, productivity, enjoyability, comfort of the journey, people will place greater importance on that because it's more salient. So one, one area in which you can create value, you can almost use a form of alchemy to create value out of nowhere, is if you're weak at attribute A and strong on attribute B, what your advertising does is focus people on attribute B so that your comparative strength becomes more important and your comparative weakness diminishes. Rory, I'd like to spend the, the remaining of our time talking about failure and success and, and to bring this discussion into a kind of a personal application, right? We talked earlier about, I thought we market to ourselves. Oh, using- yeah, we do, yeah. In my, in my book, I, I refer to, this is, I'm a terribly apologetic, but it's an absolutely useless analogy for Americans, which is, I'm... I'm a Brit, I'm a European. Europeans, particularly car lovers, have a snobbish attachment to the manual or stick shift gearbox. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, by the, by the way, actually, it has very interesting, very interesting um, effect. When you go to the US, you notice things in Los Angeles that you can have, for example, a set of traffic lights at the top of a hill. Now, you couldn't do that in Europe because 60% of the cars, shift. they've got a stick shift, and every time the lights went red, when the lights went green or again, somebody would roll back into the person behind them <laughs> by cocking it. Whereas in an automatic, you don't make that mistake. That's interesting. <laughs> so it actually affects the design of, of urban environments. Fascinating. But the stick shift devotees always say, oh, I couldn't have an automatic. I'd lose the sense of control. And what I have to explain to them is you still have control with an automatic, but you exercise it obliquely rather than directly. So you can use kick down to get your car to change down a gear. And you can, if you were nearing the brow of a hill, you'd throttle off instinctively to stop the car needlessly changing down a gear for the last 10 or 15 yards of the climb. Okay? So you, would, you, you do actually give quite a lot of information to your gearbox, but you don't control it directly. I would argue that the way we control our unconscious processes, including, for example, the placebo effect, is through this kind of oblique stimulation. Wait, would that be signaling? I can't make myself, yeah, I can't make myself, it's sort of signaling to ourselves. I can't make myself brave, but I can create the environment in which it's possible for me to act bravely. So, so it, 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 I remember a long time ago this book. Uh, I can't remember. Uh, Dress or success, right? Yeah. And 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 as and as cliche as that is, from a standpoint of marketing to ourselves, and and to your point, what you said earlier about signaling to ourselves, we can we can become more confident by not only either dressing or doing something that signals to others, but it, it uh, maybe unconsciously we signal to ourselves how we feel within an environment or a, say a suit or, a, you know, oh, we, we emphatically market to ourselves. I think most of the cosmetics industry is actually effectively what Jonathan Haidt calls self placebing, which is administering a placebo to yourself to create 
an emotional state which you cannot auto-generate through an act of will. Undoubtedly, you know, just as cosmetics or fashion affects the way women feel, it affects the way men feel. Um, uh, and, yeah, undoubtedly that um, there's a kind of, you know, if you like, we can't choose to be confident. You might argue that you can hack that, uh, that effect to some extent with four pints of strong beer. Um, <laughs> You know, you know, that to some extent, alcohol is undoubtedly... Or painkillers. Yeah. Or, or painkillers. Now, the interesting thing is that paracetamol, not only, I shouldn't actually say this, but uh, it seems to reduce social anxiety as well as reducing pain, would you believe me? So there is... There is I, should, I shouldn't really have said this, but you could... Um, you know, if you're going to a we're party... Hack, we're take, hacking. Uh, we're hacking. Or, we're hacking, yeah. And, um, it's a painkiller. It's over-the-counter in, in, in the UK? It's over-the-counter in the UK. And so, yeah, I mean, what we're undoubtedly doing is we're sort of hacking things to create the emotional state that we wish to generate in a way that cannot be achieved, just as we can't voluntarily increase the dilation of our pupils. We can't involuntarily increase our heart rate. We can't voluntarily change our frame of mind to become uh, confident, but we can put on a suit, which achieves the same effect. Yeah. I, and I think it's 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 kind of like a lighthouse. It's on all the time. I, I think we market to ourselves based on our self talk, uh, either poorly or, or you know well. In, in other words, I, I think a lot of times it's negative. Oh, we're not going to be able to do that. I, th- this is going to be too much. So let me ask you in in in, in the terms of the nudge effect, because I I read your book. I think think I think you were a co-author or the, the book Think. Were you? Oh, no, no, I wasn't going to think. Um, um, let me see. I know the book well. I might have been quoted in it, I yeah, think. Yeah, I think you were quoted. So, but it, it, they were talking about the kind of the principles of behavioral economics and, and the nudge effects from a standpoint of goal seeking, right? Or pathing, you know, the little nudges, laying out your clothes for workout or removing junk food from the cupboards. So if, if you can use that type of kind of behavioral tactics to nudge yourself towards something... I assume one can be also derailed by the nudge effect. Could they not? Could- yeah, um, undoubtedly. I mean, I think, I mean, one of the most interesting ones is, uh, <laughs> this brings me to an interesting topic, which is I'm not entirely comfortable uh, with advertising targeting through um, algorithm alone. And the reason I worry about it is if I went into a meeting in Ogilvy and Mather tomorrow and the brief was, which we don't handle any such clients, but let's say we did, the brief was to uh, sell gambling, a gamb- an online gambling product, okay? If I were to say, I know, why don't we put ads up in the meetings of Gamblers Anonymous? Or why don't we advertise booze in alcohol anonymous um, meeting spaces? Everybody would laugh, but they would basically think my suggestion was horrible, okay? And they wouldn't do it for fear of either, well, either actually for perfectly ethical reasons. I'm not saying that ad people are entirely without uh, conscience or simply because of reputational risk. But an algorithm doesn't know when it's doing that, okay? Now, okay, if I'm trying to avoid my – the most extreme example of this, by the way, is Apparently, if you've been a heroin addict, the first thing you're told is that street where you used to buy your gear, you can't drive down that street or go within three blocks of that street for the rest of your life. Okay? If you're a recovering heroin addict, you basically got to avoid the space where you used to buy heroin because eight years later, it can still exact a powerful pull. If you're trying to give up gambling, In the real world, there are reasonable strategies you can adopt, like not going to casinos, not reading the racing pages, not going into bookmakers, and giving Las Vegas a wide berth, okay? Those will all help you avoid the temptation of gambling. If there's an algorithm which is chasing you with gambling ads, even if you're reading the travel pages, and it's saying, come to Vegas, because it's identified a huge future possible value for making you fall victim to the gambling habit again and pre or previous behavior online right yeah then you know i I confidently say if if i were in a meeting in the agency and someone said hey why don't we advertise booze in alcoholics anonymous meetings it's the kind of suggestion which i I would jokingly say 
you get promoted for making the suggestion, but you get fired for enacting it. Okay, you know, I leave space within ad agencies for people to suggest crazy things, simply because sometimes the, sometimes what in creative terms the you have to climb Mount Silly before you can reach the bright sunlit uplands that lie, you know, lie beyond. So I, you know, I'd never punish someone for making a daft suggestion because we don't want to create that kind of environment. But if someone enacted that suggestion, you'd want to get rid of them and, and immediately. I mean, they're a danger. Okay. Now, an algorithm is happily doing that and reporting back on its success without anyone being aware, including the algorithm itself, of what it's really doing and the context in which it's doing it. It's just identified a group of high-value individuals, and it's pursuing them relentlessly like a stalker. Right, unless there, unless it has some other signal or some other data point to, to, to inform it and uh, as we go back into machine learning yeah. or, or AI. But the other thing is Facebook does that. So, you know, I, I encourage people, if, if they're in a bad spot in their life, you know, get off Facebook because Facebook serves up occasional memories. They'll go back and look in your timeline and they'll pull up a picture and, and, and it has no, it, it's not using, it's not discriminating whether that's a poor, a good memory or a bad memory. So it can occasionally, let's say you've gotten over something or it was a divorce or whatever it is. And then if you're on Facebook, it could say, hey, remember <laughs> or remember the worst day of your life? And here's a picture of it and, and just just destroy someone. Well, funny enough, some, some of them are really depressed me in the same way that I'm now 52 years old. And if there's one favor I've got to ask Silicon Valley, okay, is that when you have one of those roller things on a form that says date of birth, can you start it around 1970, please? Okay, <laughs> Because when you bloody well start the thing in 2005 and I have to scroll back to 1965, I'm practically conscious of my own. You know, it's like having one of those memento mori things. You might as well just say on the page, you know, <laughs> you know, the live your life glory the paths of glory lead only to the grave <laughs> yes. you might as well say do that. what you're going to do now today. do what you're going to do now because you haven't got much seize time the left. day yeah <laughs> um, so and in the same way no i mean some of them you know i mean some of them are very mixed because they show my children when they were much younger now both no, my children good memories are, there's you know i mean both my children are still alive having said that uh, yeah if one of those children had died for example Oh, and actually, there's a slight sense, you know, of, of you know, of, of of lost youth that comes from those those memories. That they are now. There's a, a stronger one I know in Facebook, which is, of course, an algorithm which wants attention, will upweight unpleasant content and downweight pleasant content. So that what what I think an algorithm would find is that someone who uh, really annoyed you would actually keep you online much longer than a joke or a pretty flower. And at some level, there's this danger, which is, there's the, it's almost the opposite of the bubble problem, which is the bubble problem is you become so convinced that everybody thinks like, like you. I mean, we saw this really in um, the Brexit referendum in the UK to a, to a great extent. Um, and, um, but equally, there's that problem where essentially it might, the algorithm might find that it's in its interest to generate conflict because conflict means eyeballs. And so that would be particularly terrifying if that was so. Well, that's, that's the basis of clickbait, right? It's, it's uh, the, the, the most outlandish. Well, I think they took it from the British newspapers, right? That whole. Um, headlines of <laughs> my, 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 my joke of clickbait is clickbait david ogilvy which is what are the 10 loudest noises in the new rolls royce number seven will astound you <laughs> <laughs> wow uh, high, high clickbait clickbait. david ogilvy yeah, yeah. so t tell me uh, on a personal level rory what uh, looking back on your career you're, you're at ogilvy and you you've you've I love your TED talks; they're they're fantastic. But uh, you you've achieved this level of accomplishment and success. But tell me, what are your glorious failures? Yeah, um, 
uh, actually, my biggest regrets uh, in professional terms, I don't, I mean, we're, we're actually, of course, we're programmed to minimize regret. And I'm sure there were decisions I could have made very differently in all manner of areas, which I don't even, you know, once you've made the decision, you tend to uh, post rationalize it. So, you know, an honest, I, I think living, living as a human being with an honest uh, regret meter would probably be intolerable. Um, however, um, the, the uh, one, one occasion I always remember from my professional life was, I probably can't really name them, but it was a, a brand in the UK who had a wonderful, long-established uh, brand positioning and slogan. And because a new marketing director came in, they put out the brief to new agencies and asked to replace the slogan. Okay, largely, I think, because this new person wanted to be seen to be doing something. There was no logical reason for, for, for the decision. And I wish I just told the bugger, I wish we just told the bugger off and said, no, this is an act of brandicide. This is actually destroying millions of pounds worth of accumulated brand value for the sake of individual vanity. It was perfectly fine, but you took yeah, it on. Yeah, it, it, was, it was magnificent, in fact. I mean, it was one of the, you know, and what was interesting is it took two weeks for the creative department even to start work adequately on this prod product, because instinctively none of us was convinced of the rightness of the decision. Mm. And that was a case where, um, you know, I, I look back at, you know, with some shame at the fact that what you might call the commercial appeal of winning a new bit of business. Mm. Did, did, you, did you learn anything from that uh, particular failure? That I think I would have, yeah, I think I would have said, I think I would have said bugger off now. I, I think now, I hope at the age of, of course, it's harder to say bugger off when you're 42 than when you're 50 something. Yeah, did you have but that hunch like, then, yeah. I mean, the ad industry is in some ways, in some ways glorious, and in some ways it's a totally daft mess, partly because the way we're paid and the way we create value are very badly aligned, I think. Um, you know, being paid by the hour is not really a... Um, we don't have a business problem in advertising. We have a, a, a brilliant article in, in The Drum by a creative person today. Advertising agencies don't have a business problem. We've got a payment problem. Um, which is we get paid for doing things which were time-consuming and not particularly important, and we give away the important and valuable stuff for free, um, which is kind of ridiculous. What would you? Well, let me ask you this: What would you consider um, the most important myths that you've discovered that are either currently accepted as true, just aren't, and, and this could be in career? in life generally, or, or in the ad business? Oh, um, one of them would be that, um, yeah, I, I think I go back to that thing I've discovered, which is that in business, there's a complete misdeployment of rational thought, which is it's used to arrive at solutions rather than to evaluate them when they've been tried, which acts as an enormous set of creative blinkers on uh, the things we try. And the fact that in any business setting, it's very, very easy to pretend that economics is true. And you'll never get into trouble for doing so. So uh, the extent to which there is a missed opportunity for silliness, not because it's actually not valuable, but because it's hard to defend. And I'll, I'll give you an example of this, which is, uh, you know, just to prove that this doesn't just apply to what sort of toothpaste people buy. It also applies to massive public policy decisions. The UK government spends 24, 25 billion pounds a year incentivizing people to have pensions by giving more or less a complete tax rebate back on your pension contributions. So every pound you pay in, if you're paying 40% tax, they pay back the tax you've paid on that income and it goes into your pension fund, okay? Now, 24 billion is a lot of money. That's a fifth of the National Health Service, okay? Now, first of all, can you think of a single business which would adopt an incentive of this kind? No. OK, I've asked people in marketing, I said, if you wanted 25 year olds to take out a pension, which would work better, a complete tax rebate for life or free iPad? And nearly everybody thinks for a second and goes, no, free iPad. OK. <clears throat> so 
Having an incentive which is massively time delayed is completely incongruous to all human um, uh, motivation. Nobody ever says, buy this now and we'll give you a free X in the year 2035. <laughs> okay, you upfront weight the incentive. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, you know, are, is the government then largely wasting 25 billion a year because economists believe that this is an incentive? And my answer to that question is probably, yeah, mostly yes. Mm. By the way, I mean, the 25-year-olds... But a second one would be, if you made the ceiling of how much you could save into your pension lower, more people would save. Because you would now have a target where you go, well, I can't pay in the whole amount, but I can pay in half. By making the ceiling on pension contributions ridiculously high, nobody feels they're missing out in a year in which they don't at least take up half their allowance. Yeah. So one of my other theories is by reducing the allowable amount, you could increase the motivation to save because you could now frame it as a missed opportunity, not as an opportunity. Plus, you could say I maxed out. I you could say I maxed out, yeah. yeah. Which yeah. would also set a useful um, uh, social rule of thumb, by the way. Mm -hmm. So people could say, what percentage of your allowable do you put in? I put in 25%, I put in 75%. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you could actually have conversations about that. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I would say is that, yeah, the, the extraordinary thing that in, in order to justify a decision, the easy way to make a decision with, for it and to avoid blame for the consequences of that decision is just to make that decision as though you are dealing with homo economicus, not homo sapiens. Well, that is all the time we have today. Please spread the word if you enjoyed the episode. Leave us a review on iTunes and share it with your friends on your favorite social platforms. Big thank you to Sam Williams, my audio guy. Make sure you visit LarryWeeks.com for all my content, and we will talk again soon.